Hello guys and girls, on this video I will be talking about the finale of Lovecraft Country, the final episode of the first season. Fingers crossed there will be more, but for now the episode is called Full Circle, so this is the 10th and final episode of season 1, and I've obviously been really positive on this show. Um, pretty much throughout, I've liked every episode up to a degree, so some more than others, but they, they've they done some really distinct and really amazing stuff with this show, and how most episodes have felt like it's kind of own genre, and the way they've used that to explore themes of race and, and the rest of it. But it's been full of really meaty themes, some great moments of horror, some just very original like visual moments and a great cast and characters so it's been a compelling watch pretty much all the way through and certainly the way they leave this episode off is it it definitely leaves room for more for a second season at least um and i think the anthology feel of the show kind of lends itself to that anyway but obviously I can talk more about that but certainly with the D character with Diane I think there's def def definitely room to do more and to grow her um, and I, I think this one definitely pays off emotionally this final episode I think it really has that feel of the big sort of like climactic kind of end battle and it does something really great when it brings all the, all the characters together even the character like Jiha who's been a very murky character and certainly sort of on the outs particularly when, when it comes to um I mean obviously Atticus had had his big issue with her but I mean she doesn't really know the rest of of them and Certainly there was a lot of heat between her and, and Yeti last week, um, Letitia, but this episode really does does a great job of bringing the group together for this, this sort of big end. Almost like a battle, I guess it does feel quite conventional in that sense, but I have no problem with that because I think the season's been built into that. I guess if you think of... The first episode and the last episode as like bookends, then I think probably they are the two most conventional episodes, but it does make sense, but even so there's stuff in this which isn't conventional and I think it really lands, it really pays everything off. Um so obviously at the end of last week, they came back from 1921. They obviously got the pages that they needed to try and bring D back to use the spell. And we see her come back and awaken, but with with really dire, you know, consequences. She's physically sort of shaken. I really like the CG, the way you, you see her hair and the sort of red lips which makes her appear like the demon version of herself but also she's obviously had her arm like severely like injured and, and it's not the same at all it's like completely like bruised and marked and just just swollen out of like proportion really you know so she can't use it as a regular arm um but there is an answer to that from Hippolyta. Um, I'm sure I'm saying her name wrong, but D in this episode is really pissed at her, and probably with with good reason in a way, or you can at least understand it from D's perspective, um, because she's obviously mad because she left her alone. And to be fair, Hippolyta does kind of fess up and own up to that but she says hey there was a good reason she tries to sort of justify it almost by saying well I went on these adventures which not even your your father could imagine and obviously Dee's Dee's not going to be talked around that, that easily she's very sort of angry um 
But yeah, Hippolyte is talking about, well, I learned how to, to draw and write and stuff. And and she says to Dee, I, I, I've found a way that you can continue your, your drawing. Um, because obviously we know from the time travel stuff that Dee goes on to become like, well, at least a comic book writer of note. So anyway... Hippolyta takes her into this room and we hear all this machinery going off in the background inside the room and yeah obviously through her time travels and, and all this sort of stuff Hippolyta manages to like manufacture like a robotic arm it is what it amounts to to replace the arm which was like damaged and essentially out of use so yeah d now has a robotic arm which is pretty cool which comes into play at one point in the episode but um yeah it's a way for her to be able to to continue writing and drawing as well as to use as as like a weapon so eventually d comes around and kind of forgives her mother I have to say, I, I, I'm i hoping Hippolyta keeps the blue hair in season two because that's pretty eye-catching stuff. Um, but yeah, from the off in this episode, we, we get some hard-hitting stuff with Atticus um, where when they're first trying to wake Dee up and do the spell and things get really intense and this leads to Atticus like, passing out basically and he then has this vision like almost a flashback to the house um from the original episode um well episode two it was but the maid which appeared to him in that episode she appears in this like vision and basically says the answers in your blood um and we we find out then then hannah um, it's Hannah, it's his mother, basically. Um, so what happens is they 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 come to this conclusion that to carry this, this whole spell out, the spell to basically take back, back power for, for black people or to take it away from white people, then they have to reverse all, all these different, like, spells that have been cast by white people over history spells which have obviously been used as kind of well bad bad spells if you like or, or racist spells so you get this first section of the episode which is really kind of powerful intense stuff um where Atticus and and um, Letitia have to have to go, they go back to the museum for example and, and that particular location that spot which I think is meant to be a tomb um, and they cast like a chant they chant and do a ritual there um, and there's this this big set piece where they appear and they're surrounded, they basically raise the dead, they raise a group of, you know, African-American characters, so for example, Atticus's mother is risen, the grandmother is there, who we saw in 1921, a bunch of other characters, and they raise like this, this racist white professor who, who kind of started all this off, and, but they need, him they need to raise him and, and reverse the whole thing to to reverse to reverse everything basically as part of it and he's confronted by you know the people who he has sinned against over history and it's a really dramatic powerful moment um but yeah it's also all about the blood about the family bloodline the answers in your blood they, they need that as part of the spell but I do love this whole idea about, you know, African-American characters in this show taking back the power, taking back the magic from, you know, these white characters that can't be trusted and have used it for, like, evil, racist means over the years. So it's kind of the perfect payoff to a lot of the things that they've done in this series, just to have this 
this reversal of power and it being reclaimed. It's almost like, in a way, it's another way of saying the story's being reclaimed by these African-American characters. Um, I think in some sense you could read it as that, but really powerful stuff, really interesting. Um, and it leads to future like storyline possibilities. I think, obviously, one thing to say is that just because they have the power back, um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're all going to use it responsibility, responsibly, because regardless of your race or gender or anything like that, there's kind of, there's people who will use things like technology in the real world. I mean, there's people who will use technology for good and for responsible things. And then there's clearly people who will use it for bad things. So it, the same applies here. I, I mean, obviously, it's an empowering sort of idea, a moment for these, you know, these African-American people who have suffered so much to reclaim the power from corrupt white folk. But obviously, it's, it doesn't necessarily follow that they will all use it in a responsible way. Um but intriguing stuff. Now, after all this, it, it basically builds to them this big ceremony, which Christina is still going to carry out, the, the one that she adopted from her father. Um, and the basically the Adam and Eve ceremony, which, you know, she needs Atticus for, she needs his blood. And... I think there's a number of like intriguing things happening in, in this episode. One is that Atticus is now very determined he will not die. He basically says at one point that that is one version of the future, but it doesn't have to play out that way. Things can be changed. And that's obviously something which opens up debates that people have about I mean, some people don't believe in a set destiny in any case. They believe that to a, to an extent they control their own sort of fate anyway. But in any case, even if you even if you believe that you're on a set path, there's obviously still things you can do to change it. Um, but it's something he, he starts believing in this episode. I think as we, we obviously get closer to the big ceremony, the big day, he's determined he's not going to die. He wants to obviously stay around, partly because of his son, who's going to be born, and the whole relationship with the, the Tisha. Um, so I think that becomes a really good drama, a really good hook for the episode it really builds this thing up where it there's real drama there's real um stakes invested in will atticus will that be his destiny or not um how can they fight it will he survive and i think they do a good job of really making it like edge of your seat stuff making it hard to predict if he will in fact die or not especially with with it being the final episode they they do a good job of building that drama up um so christina who i said was was a good you know interesting sort of villain if you like i think this episode i think obviously for the purposes of this big final sort of like battle and ceremony if you like she she obviously plays her hand and she she kind of tries to talk them into it where she says at one point well yeah maybe I can do something I can maybe save Atticus and it doesn't have to be his fate if you let me have the pages of of the book which I need and but then they refuse to do that so that kind of that sort of draws the battle lines and she uses a, her like her powers at one point or a spell to like affect Letty and that's almost like a message to them it's hey I will do damage I will 
kill her, I will kill your unborn child if you like, if, if you sort of cross me. Um, now, there's this drama with Ruby and obviously um, Christina because they've obviously gotten close, and there's this this great scene by the gra by the grave with um, Ruby and Letitia, and it's they're basically visiting their mother's grave, and Letitia opens up and says, "The reason I wasn't at the funeral is because I was in jail," um, so. She sort of comes clean about that, but it's also it also comes out that the mother wasn't very supportive. Then she kind of I don't know if abused them is the right word. I don't know if they make that clear in the scene, but certainly that sort of thing that she mistreated them and were maybe yeah sort of abusive in some way. So I think that partly you know makes. Letitia's side of things more sympathetic because hey, if, if if the mother did mistreat them, maybe you can't blame Yeti for not being that that enthusiastic and, and that I mean obviously she was in jail anyway, but you know, she is kind of down on the mother and that sort of comes out and Ruby partly defends the mother even though she knows she wasn't the best mother to them. But also, um, Letitia tries to talk Ruby round and tries to talk her into helping them with the spell and to to fight Christina. Um, and she she says, well, can, can you get this potion that we need for the spell? Um, and the, the way this scene is, is handled and the later twist is really good because we see Ruby basically turn around and saying, you know, damn it, Yeti, Yeti you, you only want to be my sister when you need something. So it plays very much and she say, no, I won't help you. And she's almost siding with Ruby again. But... Then she starts going off, and 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 Letitia calls her back and says, "But you know, you you haven't heard the whole truth." And she's about to tell us something else, something about Christina, presumably. And then the scene cuts. So that that's very interesting when you see the twist later. Um, actually, just one other thing to pick up with Atticus is that he does go to Jilla. He calls her to meet him at the bar, and he actually apologizes for being so harsh with her, like in the previous episode. And this is one of the times I, he says it a couple of times, but I think this is the first time where he actually says to Jilla, "You know, my future isn't set in stone. I, there's nothing. That's only one version. I don't necessarily have to die." And they do bond because he, he kind of like apologises to her and says, you know, I was unfair on you. And this this is what this episode does really well because it does bring all these characters together and it pushes Jilla in, in like a big step because obviously up to this point you sort of only know her through her association with with Atticus, um, and she's she's quite a murky sort of character, but she does she is like more initiated into the group, I think, in this episode, and she ends up coming along with them um, for this whole thing at the end. So she's there as part of the gang. I mean, almost like the Scooby Gang, gang in Buffy sort of thing. Um, you know, she, I mean, it's probably not a fair comparison, but she's almost a Cordelia a little bit. Um, obviously not, not as kind of harsh or like, you know, bitchy as Cordy could be, but obviously she is this sort of murky character and this character who, um, was kind of on the outside of the group but just happened to have this kind of connection to them because of the relationship with Atticus but she makes big strides in this episode and she is 
at least working with the group at the end and she does feel more a part of it and it's almost like they've accepted her more as well so so it's it's all nice stuff i really like the way the group comes together in this episode um it's hard not not to be like swept up in it but yeah, that there is a sting in the tail and the twist because Ruby does go to Christina and this that they're basically talking and um, obviously there's been this chemistry between them and that they they do start kissing. So on the one hand, it, it you know you start to think, hey, she's not gonna help the others. She's she's gonna be loyal to Christina <laughs> on this one. But then you do see her sort of eyeing up like the potion as well. So it seems like she is there to get the potion, but she's using this to um, to seduce Christina a bit, you know, so that it's easier to get. But the twist in the tale is that we later see Ruby. Um, she shows up at the last minute when they're where, when they're all about to go on like this road trip, and sh she hugs um, Letitia, and, and they kind of make up and they set off. Um, and actually, before I get to the twist, I'll say there's obviously like this musical montage. Well, not montage, but this musical scene. This like particular song i'm not sure what the song is i don't think i've heard it before but it's this kind of very upbeat you know soulful sort of song that's playing almost like a rock and roll style record and it's it's the sort of moment that could just be cheesy and throw away if it's not handled well but it does really land as a moment when they're all singing in the car and it kind of does that thing of like one of them starts singing or one or two and then it, it sort of filters through and all of them sing. I think Montrose might be the last one to start singing or something because he's very much the stone-faced Montrose but then he, he cracks a smile and starts singing and it's this just this feel-good moment where they're just brought together by, by this song really and everyone in the car singing it so it's it's really beautiful but I, I think what I'm getting to is that maybe that might throw you off the actual twist and that is that basically it's not Ruby <laughs> it's Christina in Ruby's body and that's revealed because they get to like the setting for this which is in the castle grounds of where Christina wants to do this spell and they all sort of split up and to do various things like they have to like jitter and um, who's who's well just the others they have to like do like Atticus's like birthmark in blood in, on certain part of the castle grounds so they're kind of split up and Ruby's left with Letitia and then it's revealed then it is indeed Christina in her body and and it's it's a real well sort of moment because she kind of says well you know it's your fault it, it, Christina Ruby wouldn't have had to have died if not for your meddling and so and I think it turns out she's maybe in a coma Ruby so she could maybe survive for the next season but in any case obviously it's this big turnabout um, and, and that moment I think lands really well. You get this really full on fight as well between Yeti and, and also Christina. Um, and and it obviously makes it really personal the fact that it was her sister so that that sort of adds to the drama um but yeah we go full blown with the special effects again with the really um really dramatic really kind of um very graphic gross almost like visuals but sort of very dramatic i mean christina's in like this white dress and you've got 
the blood from Atticus um, like spraying all over her because they she's she and her like henchmen have like captured him and tied him sort of chained him up for this ceremony and you get this big sort of fight on the bridge um, um, and Actually, one line, I I know it's random to go back to this, but one line I do like from earlier in the episode is where Jira says to, to a guy in the bar, says, would you be willing to fuck me? You know, or would you be willing to die to fuck me? Uh, it's when a guy, a random guy's like hitting on her own bar. And, and I love the idea of using that as a line to... Um, to get rid of a sleazy guy, but you know, obviously, yeah, there's some truth to it as well in, in the case of what she's saying. But uh, that's 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 a funny little line. But anyway, back to the whole battle, and it's all getting very dramatic. It's it's very graphic, and you see, as I said, Christina like feeding Atticus in the blood, and at one point, the Tisha goes over the over like the tower and then it's hard and it, it looks like she could be dead but I guess maybe the immortality spell has maybe helped her out of that but at one point it certainly looks like she could be badly injured or potentially dead and things are, things are getting to like a crucial stage where it looks like this could be the end for Atticus um, or certainly they could lose the opportunity to stop this whole thing and, and reverse the spells and you know take back the magic so what happens is this it's a great way to to use Gia and bring her back because we return to like the end of the episode where she featured for most of it in Korea where she was told by the like the um supernatural character i can't remember the name now but you know she was told you know you you you'll have many deaths before you kind of in your life type thing um so what happens is she uses her like her tentacles her powers to like hook up to christina and what she's doing to basically sort of cancel it out because it, it's because they're doing like this sort of charm and this thing to try and reverse it but they have to be connected to the one who's like actually doing the spell so that means christina so um jira steps in and uses her like sort of magic to block it um and there's another like smart little twist that's thrown in because they do have a backup plan, you know, assuming that Christina would be there with with backup and stuff, and that is then Atticus has has like summoned this monster which we saw in the was it the previous episode or the the episode it must have been the episode before, um, but yeah, he's got one of them, and we kind of cussed cut to like Diana reading in the car and she's like reading the Lovecraft Country book and then um add you know suddenly a monster comes out and it's a great horror moment it really surprises you it comes up to the window it's almost like a drastic part type moment but then it's she's saved by the other monster by Atticus's monster and that comes charging out and saves her um and then they kind of get involved and stuff but yeah that's another great little reveal the fact that the group had these monsters <coughs> sorry waiting in, in like these these castle grounds to, to sort of back them up but as I said, Gia sort of uses her powers and ultimately that kind of blocks the spell and ends up, you know, winning back the magic and overpowering Christina. However, Atticus does die in the whole thing. He basically loses his fight and ends up dying 
and and that's it and Montrose doesn't want to accept it but in the end Atticus almost does sacrifice himself and ends up dead or certainly was fighting at the very end and we see the group carry him um, but yeah the emotion of him dying and the big climax um, re really does hit really does land um, and it's it's a great moment to see the group carrying him. It's almost like he did sacrifice everything and went out on the biggest possible note. Now, this, I think, will lead to speculation. Should they bring him back if there is a season two? Um, what will they do? Could you have him maybe in some sort of spiritual form? Um... My feelings on it personally is that they shouldn't bring him back. Not they shouldn't bring him back to life, basically, because to me, I think his death meant a lot, and there was so much drama to it, so much emotion, um, and I think you would lose a bit of that. I think it it would undercut the importance and the moment of his death if he was then brought back. I'm not saying they shouldn't feature the character at all you can still feature him as i said maybe in supernatural form you could have i don't know maybe the occasional flashback with him or, or whatever there's still sort of a role for him but i think and they may well prove me wrong they may well justify it in how they do it but i actually think this you know he had the the perfect sort of arc on, on in this first season and I think his death sort of matters so much and it lands so much then I think yeah that should be it I think he can appear in other forms maybe but I wouldn't I wouldn't want them to bring him back to be honest as as much as I love the character I think his death is is almost too important and that's, of course, why characters die in shows or why big character deaths mean so much because they add stakes and they affect the other characters around them. So sometimes to bring them back after their death is, or to reveal that they're not really dead or whatever the case may be can sometimes cheap, cheapen things. Not always, and obviously this is the sort of show where supernatural stuff is going on and there's magic and stuff and I'm not closed closed minded when it comes to it. I mean if they justify it then that's great and certainly the writing on this show is so good but that's just the way I feel at the moment. I think also and obviously all this is depending on them getting a second season or or them wanting to do a, a second season, which I think is a little up in the air, but you can certainly see the building grounds for a second season with certain, certain things happening here. Um, but my other feeling is that I think there are other strong characters that you could build a second season around, so you you actually wouldn't need to fall back on Atticus, you know, I think Diana D has has a big role to play in the second season. Obviously, the Tisha's very strong. Montrose is a strong, established character. I think Jira could return. You know, she she could become a regular part of the group. Maybe, um, obviously, we or certainly semi regular. They could certainly go to her for various things. Um, Ruby we'll see about because she may be dead, she may not be dead, but we'll see about that. But there's certainly strong characters to fall back on if if this is like the end for Atticus. Um, now there is one final scene of course and that is Christina is still alive, she's not quite dead. And then... Um, D shows up with like one of the monsters and like stands over her 
And Christina, I think, tries to play on the fact that he's, you know, younger, maybe a bit more naive. And tries to appeal to her sympathies to, like, help her sort of thing. But, and I kind of thought this might happen, but Dee's like, no, I'm not. You know, she, she has no sympathy for Christina and she, like, kills her brutally with, with her robotic arm, like, just plunges straight into her, chokes her, basically, and blood comes, like, sort of splatting out. It's, it's again, a really... Good effect, but really physical as well. The way you literally hear her, her breath being choked out of her, her life being choked out of her. And that's the final shot. So it does show this kind of dark side to D in a way. But I think it hints that D's gonna be a be a bigger character in 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 this in the second season if there is one. Um, or certainly then they're going to play on these new powers that she's she has. Um, and I mean, if there isn't a second season, then I, it's, it's sort of no big deal. I think it's just one of these things where it, it's kind of saying, well, D has been changed, D now has these powers, and this could easily become part of who she is moving forward even if we don't get to see that. But I think certainly that's quite a big indication and they are potentially setting things up for a second season. And if I've not made it clear already, I'm really down for that. I I think this could easily be a two or three season show at least. Um, there's plenty of good stuff here. To, to build on and, and to do a second season. And I think you, they could sort of make each season quite distinct, I think, with with a different sort of theme for each season, a different feel. So. And if they follow the sort of pattern of this season with a different story each episode, or at least each episode feeling like its own genre, maybe something like that, I can see it really sustaining itself, but excellent stuff from Lovecraft Country, really good finale, and a really consistent first season. I absolutely loved it. One of the most unpredictable shows I've seen in a very long time. Just epic stuff throughout, very exciting, um, and... I mean, the TV event of the year, I think it's fair to say that, certainly for me, and I'll be surprised if anything beats it for my show of the year, to be fair. It's just been really unforgettable and so rich, so yeah, really great stuff, and I'm hoping for a season two, so... Let me know what you thought of this finale in the season, in the comments below. Were you happy with it? Were you disappointed? Would you like to see a second season? Um, if we do get a second season, do you have any ideas of how that might pan out? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Like and subscribe if you are new to the channel to help me keep this content going. You can also ding the bell on YouTube for notifications, contact me on Twitter, all the various things, and just follow my other like TV reviews. There's plenty of new reviews coming up. I'm doing Star Trek Discovery Season 3, for example, and I've casually been doing The Haunting of Blind Manor, also a Netflix show. So, yeah, keep watching TV and following the channel. And look out for my future reviews but thanks for listening and i'll see you guys again soon goodbye